How many times did you get behind the wheel after having a couple drinks? You made it home good. But what if that one night you hit that person on a bicycle? Yeah. Or what if that one time you go, you know what, man, my back's against the wall, my baby needs diapers, I'm behind on the rent, like, I'm just gonna go do one robbery. Just, you know. And I'm not saying it makes it okay, but we all make bad decisions. So you make one bad decision that affects you for the rest of your life. Stand by. Three, two, one. The following program comes from executive producer Lillian Garcia. Every athlete is on this quest. Every performer dives in head first, battling real life challenges and overcoming obstacles in an effort to make their dreams Reality. Reality. Singer, speaker, and 15-year WWE host Lillian Garcia was the first woman to ever announce WrestleMania and is now the PFL MMA cage announcer. Oh, yeah. And now she's giving you an all-access pass to the human interest stories of elite athletes, extraordinary entertainers, and wellness experts. Now let's embark on another fascinating journey of chasing glory with your host, Lillian Garcia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chasing Glory. I am Lillian Garcia, and I'm not sure if you guys can hear it in the background, but as you know, I've told you before that Chasing Glory comes to you from Hollywood, West Hollywood. Well, here in West Hollywood, there's a huge protest going on right now because of the death of George Floyd. It is awful. It is awful what has happened to that man, and I don't blame anybody for protesting and standing up and trying to end what is happening in our world. What I can't understand is here in America, 2020, land of the free, right? We're supposed to be accepting everyone and the diversity that we have here. And in 2020, we're still dealing with this. It blows my mind. And especially the fact that, you know, we just had 11 or 12 days. It is right now Saturday. And we had uh, like 12 days ago, we lost Shad Gaspard and everybody that came out for the memorial, for the wake, and for the funeral this week. It was diversity. It was beautiful. So much love, so much care for this man, and this man that really all he did was lead with love, no matter who you were, what culture, what ethnicity, what anything. He just wanted to help, and I think that's a huge, huge lesson and I wanted to bring MVP on the show because MVP was a very good friend of his. He was here in Los Angeles. I definitely wanted to do a face-to-face -face interview. And it's funny because we talk about this at the beginning of this interview with MVP. We've tried to arrange for him to be on Chasing Glory for quite a while now. But timing is everything. And the fact of the timing that we speak about his background and how he got into trouble at 16 years old and went to jail, he went to prison, and served nine and a half years there. His father, a police officer. Okay, with everything that's going on right now, it was so strong and powerful to hear the perspective from really both sides. And I think that that's the important thing right now is to really get into conversations and get the perspective from different sides. We do talk about the police and the different perspectives there as well. This is not a show about police bashing at all. This is not a show about politics where we're bashing any kind of political view that you have. I want to be clear about that. This is about bringing to the foreground situations that are happening in our world and in our country and trying to create an atmosphere of getting to the bottom of understanding people's views and pushing past because guess what? Seriously, love is always the answer. I know it sounds cliche. I know it sounds a little bit like, oh, whatever, but it's so true. Acceptance, acceptance is part of love. I will tell you my story if you don't know. When I came here to this country when I was eight years old, as an American, I lived in Spain. My dad worked for the United States Embassy in Spain because he was a lieutenant colonel in the US Army. He was stationed in Spain. I grew up there for eight years. I came 
to this country, to South Carolina, when I was eight years old. It was not easy. I was excited to come here, being an American, never living here, I was like, yay. But the acceptance that I received was not good. I wore dresses to school because that's what you wore in Spain. So immediately I stood out. And even though I spoke English, because the girls that were at the school found out that I spoke Spanish, I was instantly branded a foreigner. I can't tell you the years that I spent being bullied and how I felt so outcast from my own country. And that is what's happening here. African Americans, they are American and they're feeling outcasted from their own country and the way that they're getting treated. It's not fair, it's not right, and justice needs to happen. But of course, we speak about the looting that's going out and we speak about the riots, and those are not right either. Now, trying to understand where all of that is coming from is important. So please just lead with love. I'm gonna read something to you that I wrote. It came from my heart. On Saturday, I posted it, and it's the way I feel. And I'm hoping that you guys can embrace and expand your horizons. If you are somebody out there that is having a hard time accepting African Americans or anybody that is different than you, man, you're really doing yourself a disservice because it is so beautiful when you really do accept different cultures and different ideas. You can expand yourself. So I wrote this, I am better because of all of the diversity of friends I have in my life. I am better because I am open to different ideas and cultures. I am better because I empathize with people's different paths and journeys. I am better because I listen more than I try to make excuses for people's actions. I am better because I still have hope things can change, but now is the time for that change. We can all be better if we treat each other with kindness and respect, no matter the skin color. We all can be better if we stand for equality. We all can be better if we simply lead with love and acceptance. It's time in 2020 to grow up and leave the past immaturities behind and embrace and create a world of beautiful, accepting diversity. This photo here that I'm showing you is from the funeral, from Shad's funeral. Look at all the diversity in this photo and look at all the love that's in this photo. It says it all. Come together, embrace each other. It is time. 2020 has been a year that we have definitely, I feel like we've been in a snow globe and we've been shaken up and we're gonna see where the pieces fall. Be part of being someone to help those pieces fall into the right place. Lead with love. And now, without further ado, here is MVP's amazing journey of Chasing Glory. Born in Miami, MVP is living proof of the ultimate story of redemption. While he's achieved much success in his career, his early life has been far from suits and gold chains. Growing up in Florida, MVP was a troubled kid joining a gang at the age of 14. He got into even more trouble when he got convicted of armed robbery and kidnapping and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. After being behind bars for nine and a half years, MVP was released from prison and with the help of a corrections officer, was guided into a profession that would change his life forever. A part-time wrestler known as Primetime Daryl Davis served as a mentor and introduced MVP to the world of professional wrestling. Immediately, MVP became addicted and would begin training under soul man Alex G and current WWE Performance Center trainer Norman Smiley. 
he quickly made a name for himself in the Florida independent scene, and with his drive and determination, as well as talent, he caught the eyes of the WWE officials. After signing his WWE contract and reporting to their developmental territory, Deep South Wrestling, MVP quickly became a highly coveted free agent before signing to SmackDown in the summer of 2006. It wasn't too long before he started claiming championship gold and would actually simultaneously hold the WWE United States Championship and the WWE Tag Team titles alongside Matt Hardy. For the next few years, MVP would consistently be one of the top performers on the main roster until late 2010 when MVP and the WWE parted ways. He was able to fulfill another one of his dreams by signing with New Japan Pro Wrestling and was a pivotal part in the United States expansion of the Japanese company. He made history by becoming the first ever IWGP Intercontinental Champion and would perform multiple times in the illustrious Tokyo Dome. He also held a stint in TNA, Ring of Honor and MLW before returning to the WWE. After nearly a decade away, MVP returned to a WWE ring when he made a surprise appearance in the 2020 Royal Rumble match. He has since been hired full-time as both an on-screen performer and backstage producer. MVP has made his appearance on Monday Night Raw, helping guiding Bobby Lashley into the main event scene. Outside of wrestling, MVP has dabbled in music, having released an album, as well as appearing in the movie MacGruber. One of his biggest passions, though, is being an advocate for prisoner education, where he continues to be an outstanding example of being a success after prison. Get fired up, as it's about to get real, raw, and inspiring with Montel Vontavious Porter, MVP. All right. I am so happy to have you. First of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We've been talking about this for a while, so that we finally have an opportunity to do it, regardless of the circumstances. I know, um, I know. It's, I always say though, timing is everything. And sure. before, when we were trying to get this scheduled, um, when we couldn't connect, I was like, okay, it's just not meant to be. The timing's not meant to be. And now, when all of this happened, and having you here in the studio, because I know at one time we were talking about doing this through Skype, because you mm -hmm. live through Houston and all. And I always love to do these more in person. I think sure, it's better. Yeah. But I also love the fact that we'll be able to talk about Shad and someone that you know was so special to you, especially you were so close to him. Yeah. Um, that we could continue this. You know, last week I had JTG and we <laughs> did a really quick show in order to make that happen. But I really wanted to do it for the fans as well. And I kept hearing Shad because we were going to like go dark and not do a show. Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing Shad in my ear going, do not dare, do not dare, do a show. And I was like, let's do a tribute show. Oh, well, yeah. It any opportunity Shad could get to have people talking about him, he'd be all for it. So. Right, he's like, I want a tribute show. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. And the more people you get, the better. I, I mean, as long as you got people putting me over, yeah, that, would be, that would be Shad. Let's just say that at his funeral, he probably loved that as far as so I'm many sure. people talking about him. I'm that sure. was uh, He absolutely so would have. Um, like, like uh, who was it, Kofi said, you know, just for, you know, have, two, three hours of people just putting them over continuously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's to be sad. <laughs> I made the joke when uh, Schwarzenegger put the post up. You know, like, we all grew up with Schwarzenegger. Like, he's, you know, our, our, our action hero. And, you know, yeah. for him to, to make the post that he did about Shad, I said that Shad was in, was, uh, was talking mad shit to Umaga and Big Viss. You know, he was telling them, yo, 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 son, you see that? Schwarzenegger gave me a shout out, son. Huh? See that? <laughs> So. Aww. You know, that's special to think, though. We have to do that, right? That's the only yeah, way we wanna, can process uh, something yeah, like this. You know, I mean, death is very much a part of life. Yeah. From the moment you're born, you were born to die. Yeah. And, you know, when we mourn, we're not mourning the loss of our friend. We're mourning, we're, it's, mourning is very selfish. We're, we're sad. Yeah. Because, you know, our friend or loved one isn't there anymore. It's it's our loss. It's our pain that, that we're, right. we're 
experiencing and, and, and processing. But ultimately, we're all going to die. So I think we have to come to treat death a little differently. And, you know, I hear people talk about the celebration of life. Yeah, let's not mourn the dead as much as we celebrate the time that we had them. And I don't know who said it, but some somebody somewhere along the line said something about, you know, your born date and your die date. It's not about the dates. It's about the dash in between. Oh, I remember hearing that. Along, thank you for reminding me about that because sometimes we do need that reminder. I remember when I saw that, I was like, oh, the dash in between. What are you going to do in that dash? The dash in between. That's, that's everything. So I think that that was a beautiful thing that everyone was talking about. The dash in between, such a short life that Shad had. But he made use of that dash and he <laughs> left. <laughs> so much love and so much where people were like, gosh, I was just better because I knew him. And I, it's weird because I'm 46 now. And, you know, as you grow and you mature and you experience life, you know, you have a maturation process and, you know, and I realized with Shad's passing, Shad used to irritate the hell out of me sometimes. And I, I used to say he was like my annoying big little brother. Yeah. And I used to tell him all the time, like, dude, I, I, can, I can only handle you in small doses. And he's, oh man, you know you love me. I do, but in small doses. You know? <laughs> so we had this running thing where it'd be like, oh, here's Shad. No, no, no. But, you know, just giving each other like, you know, hard yeah. He would, he would you know, come up and give me the big bear hug, and I'd be like, man, would you let me go, man? Why are you being so extra, man? You know? But that was just our running thing. Yeah. But um, everybody was Shad's boy. Shad could meet somebody, and like the next, yo, yo, that's my boy right there. That's not your boy. You don't know that dude, man. <laughs> you just met him, Shad. That's not your boy. Yo, yo, that's my boy. Everybody was his boy. Oh, that's yeah. my girl right there. Yeah. And having been to the memorial his service and seeing the vast array of people yeah. that were in attendance from all walks of life backgrounds shad was just accessible to everyone mm -hmm. and when shad opened up to you you were his boy or his girl you yeah. know you, you were his people he just had that kind of a heart and it made me think that because I'm not always the most accessible and approachable person. I, I realize that. Through you know? the years, you have become that. I um, mean, knowing you from, from years ago, from when you first came in, 2005, 2006, I was not able to penetrate. But throughout the years later, I was. And the more, even Puerto Rico, when you and I uh, saw each other in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. we did that big thing for Hurricane, uh, was it Maria? Yeah, Maria. Yeah. Um, Immediately we saw each other and it was just like this bond and I could see as you're saying in the maturity process I can see you're opening up more which I would love to know why and what's what's causing that um, I, I guess just just living life and as we'll discuss, you know all that I've been through to be where I'm at and Then I'm looking at a guy like Shad who he would irritate me because he was so incredibly friendly like, man, why are you being friendly to all these people, man? You don't know these people, man, you know? But then when you see all the people that came to celebrate his life afterwards, and it made me think, <sighs> I, 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 was, I was too harsh. I was too critical. I should be more like that. Mm. I should be more welcoming. I should be more engaging. I should be more personable. Um, and not to say that I'm not, but I should certainly do more of that. Mm -hmm. Because if more of us, I mean, we all have our issues that cause us to be guarded or to put walls up or what have you. But if more of us were more like Shad in engaging each other, then, I mean, the world would just be a better place. You know? And that yeah. sounds so cliche and so corny and whatnot, but just realistically. The facts. If everybody just said, you know what, I'm gonna take 10 minutes a day and just do something nice for somebody. Even just Everybody sending a it. nice tweet. Whatever it is. Text. I'll hold the door open for somebody, yeah. you know, walking out of the store. So, you know, just maybe you could just create this, you know, this tsunami that just starts with a little current, you know, before you know it. Hey, everybody's just being nicer. And if the world becomes one one trillionth of a percent nicer, 
Well, that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. So, And that is something that really stuck in my head from this whole thing. I was like, wow, if I died, would there be that many people missing me, um, saying nice things about me, saying how I impacted their lives? And I was like, whoa. Think how many funerals were, I mean, and let's just be real. Think about how many funerals where shitty people die. Yeah. And then people get up there and have to say good things about somebody who's just a total jerk asshole to everyone. Just, right. you know, and you know, you try to find something good to say about this person. In this case, sure, Shad had his faults. We all do. Mm -hmm. But overwhelmingly, like when you stepped up there, there, there was only really good things to say. Yeah. You know, and to your point about, well, I posted some things on my Instagram and I was surprised because I received several DMs from people who told me about something that Shad did for them. Wow. Without them asking. You know, they met Shad, how, you know, and I had countless fans that were saying that when they met Shad, how nice he was or how cool he was. Or, but there were three DMs that I got from people that specifically told me about things that Shad did for them. One guy in particular who he uh, he was on a car ride with Shad. They were going somewhere for a show, and he was out here in L.A. and he had just been released from his contract for something else. And you know, he was just financially he was in a bind. And he didn't know what he was gonna have, what he was gonna do, and probably leave L.A. and go back home. And and he said without asking, Shad made a call, got him a job somewhere, mm. hooked him up with some some place where he could crash for a while till he got on his feet. Wow. And that guy's still here in L.A. because. Without asking Shad, hey, can you help me out? He was just like, yeah, this is what I got going on right now. And Shad took some steps to turn that guy's life around. Two other people who just, yeah, man, you know, I ran into Shad one time at a Starbucks and, you know, he did this. And it's like, wow. You know, like, yeah. And these are just three random people. Well, no, one of them's not. I know the one person, but two of them. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Right. That, you know. Right. So Shad just wanted to make people happy. You mm -hmm. know? And you can't put... I think it was said yesterday uh, at that funeral, you, you can't, you'll always wonder why. And you'll, I mean, it's just so tragic, right? You can't make sense of it. But the only thing that I'm a very big believer of trying to find a silver lining in everything. And the only thing that I can for right now, and I'm sure that as time progresses, we might know more. But the love that I have seen come out of this, the love and people are even with each other we all saw each other and remember you know even chris masters reaching out and to all of us and being like man mm -hmm. i needed i needed this unity i needed this mm -hmm. i was like you know there is a family here there's a bond and a big thing that i realized and you said it you know with all the different variations of diversity and all we don't have to be blood to be family no. So you can have family that you meet from people along the way that become very special in your life and I see you at the airport unexpectedly and immediately I have a bond and I'm like, hey, yeah, you know. Yeah, we pick up from right where we left off like yes. we saw each other last week. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it is a brotherhood, sisterhood thing that we form and I think it's a beautiful thing that from that. But with you, I know that you and Shelton had a very special relationship with him. And I do remember that he posted, Shad posted a video uh, when Kofi also won. And you were upset with him at first for yeah, posting that I was video. very upset with him for doing that. Yeah. Were you upset because you felt like it was, well, you tell me. I, you know, I felt upset because I thought that that was a private moment. Mm. That wasn't, saying. you know, that wasn't for, you know, to public consumption. That wasn't for the dirt sheets or, you know, for whatever. And, you know, I know Shad is, you know, very ambitious and he likes to do the social media thing and I'm like you know, at first I was kind of hot because I'm like yo man that was don't don't post that shit for likes mm -hmm. you know like I, that, was, that was a moment you know? which I don't think he was doing that. no 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 but I mean I was I was just angry about it right you know? right and I, I let him know as much I hit him up I'm like yo that was bullshit man you know and um when I saw the response to the video mm-hmm and I saw what people were saying, and when people were able to understand what it meant to see Kofi win the WWE Championship to us. Yeah. Um, 
not, I mean, on multiple levels. I was in developmental with Kofi. Like, I remember when he got there, you know, and, and I'm often humbled and flattered by him saying how when he got there, I was one of the first people to, open, you know. Um, and in, the, in those days, you remember, it was kind of rough coming in, got yeah. a little bullying and hazing and, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, I came in with, with, you know, with, I had already established myself with some of the made guys, so I was treated a little differently. And, um, but I wasn't into the bullying and the hazing. I always thought that was kind of lame. And, you know, Kofi would talk about how, you know, I was very nice to him at a time when a lot of guys weren't being nice, you know. Right. But I liked him. He was a genuinely good guy. Yeah. So to see such a good husband, father, friend, put in the hard work and attain something um, that's you know, like the apex of our industry. And, you know, Kofi was born in Ghana. Yeah. And grew up here. So literally an African American yeah. is holding the WWE championship for the first time. Yeah. That was a huge moment yeah. because growing up, I remember seeing Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson and saying, man, when I grow up, I want to look like that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that they were, and people, you know, the issue of race is always a sensitive one, especially in these days. But when you grow, I'm 46, as I said. So growing mm -hmm. up, all the movies, the heroes are white. Right. All the television shows, you know, the, the, the heroes are white. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a lot of superheroes or role models that look like you. Right. And Barbies. It, Barbies, white. right, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. so you don't, it, it, if you're not made aware of it, it's not something that you necessarily realize. So when you do have a hero, when you do have a sports figure or an actor that you can identify with, hey, he looks like me, you know? Mm -hmm. So to see Kofi with the WWE Championship, that gave millions and millions of little kids around the world a hero who they can identify with. Yeah. Like, wow, he looks like me. Right. You know? I could be a black champion too. Yeah. You know? And I, it's difficult for some people to digest that, but for the most part, it's not that hard to no, understand. Of course, you know? of course. Um, and, and so on multiple levels, because it was Kofi, such a deserving guy, yeah. such a great guy. Yeah. Um, and to see other people, once he posted the video, respond and, sh and share their sentiments that, it, you know, for all the same reasons. And um, I had to call Shad back and apologize. Like, all right, man, you made the right call. And he said, what? I was right. I was right. <laughs> I said, hey, man, don't, don't, don't press your love, man. Just say it one more time. Just say I was right one more time. Like, nah, I'm not saying nothing, man. As a matter of fact, screw you. And, I hung up. <laughs> and he sent me laughing emojis, you know. But, yeah. But he, yeah, he made the right call. But I was hot with him for it. But, you know, in yeah. retrospect, like I said, seeing how everyone responded to it, he made the right call. Mm. So I really want to step into your story because I saw your TED Talk and thought it was really, really good. Thank you. And when I heard it, I was, I was in, I knew you'd gone to prison, but I didn't know the full story. And I definitely did not think about the fact that after you leave prison that you every time you apply for a job or apartment or anything like that you have to put convicted felon yes mm -hmm. and then how that can brand you and people can literally go oh never mind and you made such a good point to talk about hey i served my time this is what i was given and i served it and that should be it. Like I should be able to step back out and go, I paid my dues, but no, it continues. Mm -hmm. Why does it continue? Who's making that law, first of all? Um, well, there's definitely a political aspect to it, unfortunately. What would be the benefit? All right. Let's go for it. Let's take Florida, for example, yeah. my home state. Yeah. Um, they put a referendum on the ballot to restore voting rights to convicted felons. Oh, because you can't even vote? I, no, I don't have the right to vote. I lost my right to vote before I was old enough what? to exercise it. What? But you pay taxes. But I pay taxes. Okay, something yeah. else I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. When you're convicted of a felony, in most places, you lose your right to vote. Permanently. 
Jesus. I mean, I could see if you this lose would, the right to vote would, for your for your time that you served. That's you know, I can see that, but not after well, you serve. Okay. Voter disenfranchisement. So, the problem that we're dealing with is specifically in Florida. We'll show you. Over sixty percent of the population voted that once someone has served their time in prison, their right to vote should be restored. Okay. The law, as it was written on, on the books, uh, said, uh, and with law you have to be very specific about words, so I'm paraphrasing, forgive yeah. me. But basically, when you've served your sentence, you can vote. So the Republicans in Florida decided that serving your sentence means paying all of your fines and any restitution or anything. Not just that you get out of prison, but that you satisfied whatever other aspects of your sentence were. Okay. The reason for that the Republicans in Florida say, well hey, this is what the law says. However, the overwhelming majority of people that would have had their rights to vote would be primarily black voters and people of a lower financial status. People who tend to overwhelmingly vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. So from a position of power, um, it's believed that the Republicans are attempting to prevent those people from regaining their right to vote because the last several elections in Florida have been very close. Mm -hmm. If you remember George Bush and Al Gore, mm -hmm. it came down to you know the, the hanging oh, yeah. chads and you know a few hundred votes. Right. So now you shift the balance of power in Florida yeah. if all of a sudden you add a million voters and say six or seven hundred thousand of those voters would vote Democrat. Why would they vote Democrat? Why are they assuming that they would automatically oh, vote Democrat? Oh, because there's a, a, a disproportionate number of, of black people who vote Democrat. Okay. Um, and, and the prison system in Florida is, uh, while black people make up less than 12% of the population, they make up over 50% of the prison population. And at that point, now we're getting into, you know, talk about uh, systemic racism and, and, and history and economics, and there's so many different things that come into play there. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I want to I wanna make it very clear, I think if the roles were reversed, I think that the Democrats would do the same thing. I think that it's just about power. I don't think yeah. that any particular, and disclaimer, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a liberal, I'm not a conservative. I like to think for myself. I don't think that any political party has a monopoly on good ideas. You know? I love that. So, um, but it would stand to reason based on the fact that in Florida, the majority of the people who would be benefiting mm -hmm. by this would most likely lean Democrat in their voting, it would behoove the Republicans to try to thwart that. Um, but again, I think if the roles were yeah, reversed yeah. and the Democrats were in a state where most of the people if it, all things are reversed, yeah, and that's yeah, what yeah. we get like, when yeah. we're dealing with politics. Yeah. If my guy does it, I'm not upset about it. If your guy does it, it, it's 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 a national yeah. it's a national issue. You know, I say all the time. You know, when Bush was president, I saw people excoriate him for certain policies. When Barack Obama came became president and continued those same policies, the people who were Barack Obama guys didn't criticize Barack Obama, mm. Obama for carrying on those policies. Or, you know, when Barack Obama was deporting people, you know, they called him the deporter in chief. Mm. A lot of people forget that, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're a Barack Obama guy, it's cool. I am no fan of Trump. Right. But don't give Trump shit. I don't like hypocrites. Stuff. Yeah, that, but that's all politics is, and this is yeah. what we're coming down to. Right. My issue, it's tribal. I know? was just gonna say because Going into this, and not to stay on this topic, um, because I really want to get into your story more too, is the Democrats have been in power though too, and they've had the majority. Why not change that law? If that's the way they were thinking, and they have well, the majority. Well, now you get into the issue of for-profit prisons, government contracts, where, and, and, and I know just about Florida specifically, where there are prisons that have a contract with the government to run at a 90 some odd percent occupancy rate. This is the contract that they have with the government mm -hmm. that you must keep us occupied to this percent 
or you're in violation of the contract. Holy moly. So the whole concept of having a for-profit prison, we're running prisons to make money, should, in my opinion, in itself be illegal. Yes. You shouldn't be able to use the, the penal system to right. make money. Right. This is my opinion. But going back to the original point and taking the politics out of it, generally speaking, we say the, the term, you've paid your debt to society. Mm -hmm. When you were a kid, you did something wrong, you got grounded. Yeah. You spent a couple of days in the house, in your room, without, you know, yeah. whatever. And then, okay, you can go back out. You're good. Right. If you are a burglar and you break into someone's home and you steal their property and you get caught, you go to prison and you serve your time. When you get out, you're supposed to have a clean slate. But because you're a convicted felon now, this goes with you everywhere you go. So when you try to fill out a job application, the question is asked. Now, there would be those that say, well, yeah, doesn't an, and doesn't an employer have the right to know if you've committed crimes mm -hmm. before? I mean, shouldn't someone know what kind of person they have in their employee? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, a, that's a fair discussion. I'm not going to say yes or no. We can have that conversation. Yeah. But to tell me that I can't live in this apartment complex, you won't rent, you won't lease an apartment to me because of a crime that I committed however many years ago. You won't give me a job because of a crime that I committed however many years ago when society says you paid your debt. So the problem is you have basically uh, legal discrimination, government sanctioned discrimination almost. Right. It says you're a convicted felon, so I have the right not to let you live in this apartment complex because we do a background check. You got in trouble for something once. You can't live here. And again, we have the conversation. Well, what if it's a violent criminal? Don't I have the right to know if my neighbor is a violent criminal? Right. And again, that's a conversation we can have. But the overwhelming majority of people going into prison and coming home aren't violent criminals. Sure, you have some. But just because I commit a violent crime once doesn't mean that that's who I am forever. Yeah. When I was 16, I committed a robbery. I pled guilty. My sentence was 18 and a half years. Of that, I served nine and a half. I was released. And no parole, no probation, time served, time off for good behavior. And all these years later, I still can't vote. <sighs> um, and one of the issues going back to Florida, just to bring up, yeah. what a lot of people don't realize is, okay, when you get sentenced, you also have sometimes fines and court costs that go along with your case. So let's just say you're a mid-level drug dealer and you get sentenced to prison time and the judge also gives you fines. Well, if you're getting, let's say, five kilos of cocaine and you're sentenced to prison for you know 20 years mm -hmm. and you get out eight, nine years later and you, you were sentenced to, uh, you got a... a $50,000, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know exactly what the laws are, but let's just say, you know, $50,000 fine per kilo or something. And now you're getting out of prison where you're trying to find a job anyway. It's difficult enough. And you have an enormous debt. And now you owe, and, and yeah, and, and fines to the government, however many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh my gosh. And then court costs, because right. in the state of Florida, there is no money in the budget to take care of court costs. Yeah. So each county has a clerk of the court that assesses court costs. Mm -hmm. That's how they pay. Most of those court costs never get collected. Mm. So the clerk of the court just assesses as many as possible so they can take as much as they can get because they don't get most of it. Wow. So now you have restitution, potential yeah. to a victim, you've got fines, and you've got court costs and you're making minimum wage. So effectively what you're saying is, okay, legally you've served your time in prison, but now you need to come up with, I don't know, let's say $100,000 in, in fines. And then once you pay that, we'll let you vote. Yeah, wow, that's insane. That's something I didn't know. But my question then is, I think places like Japan or China or one of these places, they literally have it. If you commit a crime, they, they'll 
cut your arm. I don't know if it's now the same, but there was a time. Saudi Arabia. Oh, okay. You cut Saudi your Arabia. head off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chop your hand or, off. Or hand off or something, mm-hmm. right? So it deters people into committing a crime. Here, do you, what do you think is the problem? If people know that they're going to go to prison, they're going to have those fines, they're going to have a, a record for life. Why do you think people are still committing crimes? Oh, this is a whole nother, you know, socio-political discussion, but... That's political too, yeah? Uh, well, aspects of it, because usually crime is parallel with poverty. Yeah. And, you know, then when you get into discussion of poverty, you know, poverty areas are often higher, you know, minorities. Um, but then again, you know, some of the worst poverty in the United States could be found in the Appalachian Mountains, you know. Um, but a lot of crime is committed because of lack of economic and educational opportunities. A lot of the people who commit crimes, if they had economic and educational opportunities, probably wouldn't go down that path. Um, and then there's greed. You have people who do work very hard. And you know, hey, this is the society we live in. It's hard to make ends meet. But I can go do this and make a little extra money. Mm-hmm. And it's wrong, but you know. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have people who are just despicable people. You yeah. know, or people who are just lazy people. I don't want to get a job, but I'll go rob people. Okay. There, there are multiple factors, but I think the overwhelming factor when it comes to crime is uh, economic opportunity and educational opportunity. Okay, so then take me to, you're 12 when you got in the gangs? Uh, 14. 14, 14. all right. What made you decide to go in, because wasn't your dad a police officer? Mm -hmm. So how does a kid whose father is a police officer end up in a gang? Um, My father, we had limited interaction. Like I didn't grow up in the same house my father my parents split when I was real young okay so my father would get us on the weekends sometimes um, you know, he was around but he wasn't like a daily influence in my life and again I mean I'm growing up Miami in the 80s I'm seeing cops doing cocaine and smoking weed and Jeez, you know, that's this. when cocaine really yeah got there. yeah it was like in, in that's the 80s that whole yeah, thing with the cocaine cowboys or yeah. yeah check out cocaine cowboys from uh uh, my boy Billy Corbin and Alfred Spellman, Raconteur Productions. They found a way, I remember seeing the whole thing about Columbia, found a way through Miami to get it right. into it's, it's the U.S. Phenomenal, phenomenal documentary. But that's the Miami that I grew up in. Wow. And yeah, so I'm, I'm seeing cops, you know, the Miami River cops. There was all this corruption and drugs, and it was just insane. So for me, I tell people all the time, growing up in South Florida, like, I knew what a Rolex presidential was when I was nine years old, and I knew what it cost. And I also was precocious, so I knew that I would never own a Rolex presidential working a nine-to-five job. Mm-hmm. You know, I see my, my parents, you know, they did okay, but, well, not my mom, but my dad more so because he had a county job. But I want a Mercedes and a condo on Brickle and a Rolex watch, you know. Um and watching Miami Vice and, you know, I'm seeing Mm -hmm. these these people around me that, you know. So I got bullied really bad when I was in seventh grade and I got beat up a lot, you know. It was all kinds of really, like, my mother's white, my father's black and I grew up in Miami. So most of my friends were Hispanic and it was always funny because the black kids would call me white boy and, and cracker, and, and the white kids would call me nigger, and you know. Would, wow. But the Spanish kids would just make fun of me because my Spanish was funny. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. they look like you, they look like yeah. me, and everything yeah. in between. Yeah. You know? And I and plus, I mean, who doesn't love Latinas? You know? <laughs> exactly. Si, si, ya verdad. So, um, I started hanging. I was into graffiti and hip hop, and I started hanging out with these New Yorkans and these Cubans, and it was just kind of that whole influence. And I never asked to be in a gang. Just the guys that I was hanging out with that were in the graffiti kind of became my, my crew. Mm-hmm. And I went through this thing where I got bullied really bad. I was getting beat up every day. And my mom got tired of me coming home with black eyes and split lips. So she changed my school to a different school. 
The school that she changed me to happened to be the home school of the main guy that I was beefing with. Okay. Because he had transferred to the other junior high. Oh, wow. So he ended up getting into some shit, and his mom brought him back to his home school, which I was going to now. Wow. So one day I walk into my math class, and he's sitting there, he looks up, and he's smiling at me, and I'm like, no way. <laughs> I'm like, I just tried to get away from you. <laughs> So eighth grade, I spent eighth grade, and uh, I went to a junior high school, John F. Kennedy, which uh -huh. was right by North Miami Beach Senior High School, and it was right by the mall. So everybody went to the mall. Eighth grade, I never went to the mall. I don't want to go to the mall because they might be there, you know? Yeah. So all of eighth grade, I spent leaving school, and I found a bus stop because I used to catch a metro bus, and that, met, that bus stop was right across the street from a little plaza that had a comic book store and a Chinese food restaurant. And um, throughout my teen years, I always had some sort of a job. Back then I used to sell newspapers and I always had some kind of a hustle. So I always had money in my pocket that I earned and mm -hmm. you know, I could get a couple comic books and get a pint of fried rice and that was my routine. And then in ninth grade is when I got cool with the graffiti crew and um, we ended up becoming one of our members was he was in a gang then he ended up just kind of associating us with that gang so i became a gang member by accident i never mm. walked the line i never had to do anything to get in yeah. and one of the other chapters from our gang came to our junior high school to beat up some guys and one of those guys i was cool with so i intervened and then like a little riot broke out and i remembered how i felt all of eighth grade being ostracized and picked on and oh you're a pussy oh you got beat up you didn't do anything about it uh mm -hmm. and ninth grade that shit just came out it exploded and yeah. i beat the shit out of that kid mm -hmm. and all of a sudden this the people that used to kind of fuck with me stopped fucking with me and people that i used to kind of be scared of they were scared of me now mm. and i just saw this this empowerment and I'm now, like, fighting wasn't scary anymore. Fighting became a release. And then fighting became fun. And then all of a sudden my name's out there. And, you know, then we're going to little gang fights in Coconut Grove and, and Tropical Park. And yeah, people would ask me about high school sports. I'm like, man, that was for suckers, man. You know, the, the same recognition you got for catching a touchdown and winning the school... I got that for knocking somebody out at a party, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd rather have that than that, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd rather for my name to be ringing on the streets than ringing in the PTA, I don't care, you know? Yeah. And then shit just snowballed really, really quick wow. from that point. Wow. And there was nobody that, like your mom, did she see this happening? Did she? Yeah, of course, you know, my mom. But she couldn't rein she, it. She did the best she could. Your dad? Has um, he seen it happen? Yeah, my dad too. He, he, you know, he was, he, when I really started kind of getting into trouble, like I remember there was one night specifically that I did some vandalism and I was 14 and I was hanging out with a few friends of mine who were 18 and 19. We were downtown Miami mm -hmm. and we used to pull this little scam where we'd get off of work and we would rush to this club because if you got there at the right time, they would give you a stamp. And then my buddy would give me a ride home, drop me off, and he'd come back later and hang out at the club. I wanted to hang out at the club, too. Mm -hmm. I want to see the club. So we figured out where we could take a Sharpie and kind of half-ass draw the stamp and then mm -hmm. smudge it. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we walk up, the bouncer would look at him. Yeah, go ahead. You know? Yeah. So the cop stops me, and he asked me if I did the graffiti, which what he asked me about, I didn't do. Okay. And he said, what are you doing out here anyway? I was, oh, I was at that club over there. He was, didn't you just say you're 14? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing at that club? I'm like, oh, shit. <sighs> so he said, look, man, I know you did the graffiti. Just admit it and I'll let you go. And I was like, for real? So yeah, I did all that. I did all, and he goes, okay, hands behind your back. I'm like, but you told me. Yeah, I lied. And then they called my dad to come get me. I called my mom. Uh -huh. And my mom said, no, fuck it, call his father. My dad came to get me at like two in the morning or whatever it was, and he was not happy. No. And uh, 
he took me to the Day County Jail, to the juvenile floor, which was brutal, a brutal place. You know, just imagine a bunch of teenage testosterone-filled boys trying to prove that they're men. You know, mm -hmm. you got the gang affiliations, and it was a rough place to be. And my father said, look, if you don't slow the fuck down, this is what's waiting for you. Is mm -hmm. this what you want? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely not. However, the streets were calling me. And I, I, I liked that, that adrenaline rush, and I, I liked the fighting. And, and then the robbery started, and I started robbing people. And I enjoyed it. And you know, I tell people, people, oh, you got sent to prison at 16? Oh, you, you were so young, you made a mistake. No, I didn't make a mistake. I never accidentally pointed a gun at somebody and said, give me your money or I'll shoot you. I made bad decisions. But I, I absolutely that. deserve to be in prison. Mm -hmm. I, ab I, I should have been in prison longer if you figure all the stuff that I got away with. Mm. So if I'm being honest, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I'd probably be in for life if I got caught for right. everything I ever did. So I made a series of bad decisions to do some you know, robberies and shootouts and gang-related violence and all this nonsense. Um, and then when it finally caught up with me and reality hit me in the face, I said, look, you're going to prison. Yeah. I remember having that moment. I had, I had a very grown up moment with myself at 16, maybe 17. I was in the county jail and I was looking at spending the rest of my life in prison. And my father tried, my mother tried, like, you know, I had a number of people who were positive influences tried to deter me from that. But the negative influences were so much stronger on me. And I had to look in the mirror and be like, don't cry now. You asked for this. You had several chances to step off this train. Mm. This train brought you here. So if you spend the rest of your life in prison, it's your fault. Mm. And you know, I ended up, uh, yeah. I was charged with one count of armed robbery, 10 counts of armed kidnapping. Because in the state of Florida, if you lock someone in a closet to facilitate a robbery, they call that armed kidnapping. I was wondering about that because I saw the kidnapping. Yeah, people, oh, you kidnapped out. somebody. I never kidnapped anybody. Right. And, it you was, know. Yeah. But if someone came in here right now and locked us in the bathroom and took our money and left in Florida, that would be two counts of armed kidnapping. Okay. So there were 10 people in okay. the casino that I robbed. And we locked them in the closet. Yeah. So I had one count of armed robbery, 10 counts of armed kidnapping. Each one of those punishable by life in prison. So at 16, I was facing 11 felonies punishable by life. So after a year in the county jail, I made a plea deal and I never gave a statement. So- Do you wish you would have? No. Okay. No, no, no. As a matter of fact, in, in some weird twisted way, there's a part of me that can stand up and look myself in the mirror and say, I never ratted, you know. The guys involved gave statements on me but I never gave a statement. That was part of the reason they were so hard on me. Okay, you want to be a tough guy? All right, tough guy. Uh, this is what you get. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, looking back, no, I, I think I handled it the way you're supposed to handle it. You screw up, you did it, take yours on the chin. Mm -hmm. When you start telling on other people, well, he did it too, can I get some time off? Yeah. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of respect for that. Do you wish that there was anything that anybody could have said? Or do you, do you feel like anybody could have said anything at that point to deter you? I don't think so, not at that point. I had one of my best friends was shot and killed by a rival gang and it just the, the chaos and tumultuous lifestyle that I was in at that time, I wanted that. What would you say to your younger self? Have <sighs> you ever thought of that? I've, I've thought of that a few times and I think that an older me, going back to talk to a younger me, might have been able to uh, to influence me to make some minor changes, but I think the path that I was going down would have. In I like nice shit. I wanted nice things, and what do they represent? What is those nice things? What is the Rolex? What does all of that represent? Success. Because that's what you grew up and in instilled. This is success. All the successful people around me have Mercedes and condos and money is success. 
and you know, I, I see the, the politicians on Capitol Hill. It's their crooks and they're loaded. I see the, you know, the contractors, you know, with the, you know, bribing mm-hmm. for bids. Everything's a racket. This is in my mind at, at mm-hmm. my age. I'm saying, I, yeah, I could go to school for the next eight years to try to become a doctor or a lawyer, but that's not tangible. I might not be alive in a few months. Let me get this now. You know, and I'm seeing the immediate success of hustlers and players and, you know, I, I, I was twisted. And I was very impressionable as a teenager, but that's what I wanted. I wanted that life. That life was attractive to me. So I had to deal with the circumstances that came with it. And then once I was in prison, Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I realized, you're going to be here for the foreseeable future. And you might not make it out of here. Because it was violent. It was ugly at times. Mm. That's when there was an overnight growing up process. And at that point, I realized, okay, I want to get out of here, and I don't ever want to come back to this. And it wasn't too late. Unfortunately, there were older convicts that I met who were like, hey, kid, you're sharp. This isn't for you. Oh, wow. And they took me under their wing, and they said, they taught me things like, hey, don't serve the time, make the time serve you. You know, Mm -hmm. they would give me books and magazines, hey, kid, read this, you know. So I knew. Because the Department of Corrections, they don't do any correcting. There's no rehabilitation. Um, now it's more of like warehousing. That's horrible. And you know there are some institutions that have some educational program, but there's not enough for everybody. Yeah. And I'm not gonna sell you on some fantasy land that you know that. Oh, everybody in prison is nice, and everybody. Oh no, I can't even imagine that. No. Because I'll tell you, there are some dudes in there that should be ground up into hamburger meat and fed to pigs. Right. Horrible, horrible people. But there are some really good people who yeah. had one bad night. You know, yeah. think how many times, and this is a rhetorical question, how many times did you get behind the wheel after having a couple drinks? You made it home good. But what if that one night you hit that person on a bicycle? Yeah. Or what if that one time you go, you know what, man, my back's against the wall, my baby needs diapers, I'm behind on the rent, like, I'm just gonna go do one robbery. Just, you know. And I'm not saying it makes it okay. But we all make bad decisions. So you make one bad decision that affects you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty uh, strong. But if there's a kid out there that's 16 right now that is like, I want the nice car. I want that Rolex. I want all those things. There's no way I can see that in a regular job. So maybe I'll, I'll do the same thing and rob and go down that path, and everyone's trying to help them. Have you been in a position, because I know that you speak mm-hmm. at juvenile and youth places, and, and prisons, prisons and, yeah. and all of that. What do you say to those kids? Like if there's a kid right now out there listening to this that's wanting to make that choice. Well, first of all, rather than talk to them, I've learned to listen. Mm. They're always being talked to. People are always telling them things. Listen. Take time to listen. Sometimes you just need somebody to listen. But if they don't have anybody to listen right now, like anybody right now listening in the audience, they can't get directly to you. I know you like, you you accept DMs and all that, but if they can't get directly to you, moms try to talk to them, dads try to talk to them, their aunts try to talk to them, sister, brother, teachers. Well, I, I guess it comes down to the, the, the old saying with like, you know, alcoholism or drug abuse. You have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. They know they're going to prison for robbery if, if they get caught. They've got friends dying around them. There's a sense of hopelessness. And all I could ever try to do is let them see, try to cast a little light to shine through that, that layer of hopelessness. But it's almost one of those things where... Yes, I can say, I went to prison. I did the things you did. It's not cool. I've seen your future, and it's not that bright. Well, what's my alternative? So I'm going to try to tell this kid, well, yeah, just stick it out and go to school and focus on that and graduate. And then, you know, try to get a technical school so you can, you know, get a certificate and make $50,000 a year. Sometimes I think those are life lessons that have to be taught harshly. Don't touch the pot. It's hot. Oh, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But I feel like you could have, because I, I know that you didn't aspire to be a wrestler. Like it was something that in prison, from mm -hmm. what I understand, yeah. you came across, right? But there's been many wrestlers that have wanted this kind of lifestyle or NBA players or, you know, just doctors and lawyers, whatever, that have wanted nice things that are like, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I feel like you could have become a wrestler without having the prison in your background. No, because I had no interest in it. Or you could have, okay, so basically uh, the what only I'm saying reason, is, okay. basically what I'm saying is, for the 16 year old that's out there listening, is there something that you can even say that you don't have to go to prison to then make something? Because you made something of yourself. Yeah, after I went to prison. Yeah, I understand, <laughs> no, but not I'm every wrestler goes to prison first sure, and then sure. makes something of themselves. The problem is, what I can say versus life experience is difficult. You know, I can tell you how much prison sucks. And I can tell you about how this lifestyle doesn't mean anything. And I can show you what I did and what I went through and, and where I wound up. But trying to convey that in a way that a 16-year-old who's shrouded and, 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 like as I said before, hopelessness, who, you know, his or her social elements, peer pressure, is way stronger than the pressure that I could potentially try to uh, not true. pressure, influence, mm -hmm. try to exert. But, you know, I would say, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. You know, find something that you like and have a laser beam-like focus and work hard on achieving that. I could say that. Um, and I do say that. You know, usually I say stuff like that to ex-convicts. Like, okay, once you've made the mistake, now let's focus on not doing it again. Because I feel like, sadly, so many men and women, regardless of their race, usually it's an economic thing, are, you know, we talk about the, the school to prison pipeline. Inevitably, their future is prison because there aren't educational opportunities for them. And they come from impoverished neighborhoods where there's no way out mm -hmm. that they see. Everybody that they know, all of their social influences are dropouts or you know they, it's, it's just what they know so what they see yeah is the nba star or maybe i can play ball and make it out or they see the drug dealer mm -hmm. like he's got these corners on lock he gets respect he has nice shit and then they see the bus driver and it's funny the uh, a bronx tale comes to mind mm -hmm. you know nobody respects the bus driver He's a sucker. He works. He goes to work 80 hours a week mm -hmm. or whatever, you know? So I, I, so I find myself struggling with what do I say? How do I exert influence to dissuade a kid from taking the path that I take, took? Um, except to say that, as my father used to say, a hard head makes for a soft ass. Sometimes these are lessons you have to learn on your own. Yeah. And then I can come afterwards and say, okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about how you're going to move and forward. And I'm trying to get to the kid before he goes down that road. And because there's a lot of also repercussions that to the person that he commits the robbery or kidnapping, now they, as a victim, they're terrified or they've been injured or whatever. So trying to get the kid before all of those things are committed. But that takes a concerted effort. Yeah. And, and this is where I come back to educational opportunities and economic opportunities and social programs. Right. Uh, you know, again, going back to my father. Yeah. I used to beg him to take me to the police athletic league. I wanted to box. Mm. So bad. He never had time. Uh, he would always promise to do it, okay. but it just never came to fruition. So if I was accountable for my time, if I had some place to be, well, I can't go hang out on the corner because I got to go to my boxing training. That's brilliant right there. I think telling that 16-year-old, go find something uh, uh, and telling the parents how important it is to provide those kind of services or you know places where the kid can not be in trouble and not put themselves into that environment. But now we're talking about parents a lot of these kids like myself came from single parent homes yeah where you got a parent that's working 8 10 12 hours a day and you know parent gets home maybe 
maybe they'll check on your homework. You know, maybe yeah. my mom had time to cook cook something. You know, make sure we were. You know, and half the time I had a job anyway, so I was yeah. coming and going. You know, yeah. she wasn't worried about what I was doing as as much mm-hmm. because I was for the most part responsible. But you know, you're dealing with impo- primarily impoverished communities where there's one parent in the house. The the economic opportunities aren't the same. So yeah, you want to tell a parent, hey, get your kid in, enrolled in after school activities. Well, in this area, there aren't after school activities, or uh, you know, I really can't afford the enrollment fee for that afternoon activity. It's it's a really complicated problem, but that is definitely. Definitely, if not a solution, a factor. Accountability mm-hmm. for time. If you right. can take these kids and give them something positive to do, yeah. to focus their time and effort on, then yeah, that will help to deter them from going down that path. But remember, in my case, I, there's not a high school that I went to that I wasn't asked to play some sort of a sport. And you didn't want it. I don't want to play basketball. I want to go hang out over here. Mm-hmm. So trying to persuade the kid that that's not cool this is cool that's the problem that i'm trying to figure out how, how do i tailor that message how can i dissuade that kid from wanting to go hang out in the corner and emulate those bad guys and be the nerd but you're the perfect person i think because you've been there for example i talk about how i experienced an eating disorder i had bulimia for many years and i talk about it freely because I want people to know, A, you can have it and get through it Mm -hmm. and not have to deal with it for the rest of your life. I also talk about what got me into being bulimic to begin with, and it was looking at the magazines, Mm -hmm. looking at all, it is the influence of all, right? And no, I didn't want to be on a diet. I I was a friend and influence was like, hey, you could eat all of this and then you can just purge it and you can keep eating and purging and you don't gain weight. They don't tell you about the repercussions of Mm -hmm. losing your hair, your teeth go gray, acid reflux, Mm -hmm. now I can't sing, get vocal nodules, this is my prison. I Mm -hmm. had my own prison. I lost my voice. I couldn't sing for a long, long time in the band. That for me was prison because it took away something that I absolutely loved. I'm not equating it to prison, let's be clear. Of course, of course, yeah. Okay. But for me, my repercussions of it, really bad. There are always consequences for your actions. Those were the consequences for those actions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my goal that I saw, like you were like with the material, the Rolex of this, whatever, it was like the skinny body, the skinny body. I can be accepted. I can have this, right? But I talk about it now and I talk about the repercussions and how there is another way. There's another way. Had I known the proper diet had i known how i could not feel like i was constantly starving and known some balance and somebody taught me that um and there's now the internet thank goodness you can find a lot of stuff there but that's my my whole point (laughs) good and bad you're right good and bad my whole point is trying to get like i said the, the beginning but let me ask you this too because i think there's a lot of people that will say that they've gotten then the Rolex, they've gotten the house, they've gotten the car, they've gotten all these material things, and then they realize, wow, I thought I was gonna be feeling something so magnificent with all of this stuff, and that stuff is not filling me, which is why the highest rate of suicide are like millionaires, and people get blown away by that. I can't relate to that, because when I got all that stuff, I was great. Did you? (laughs) (laughs) I care. I, I was very happy. <laughs> there was no. I got all this stuff and I'm miserable. I well, I know. think that there's some people that become millionaires. They think they're going to be happy. Um, yeah. It be, and the problem is that they haven't been fulfilled internally. They're not fulfilled. Or yeah, a I wound. Um, you know, your bullying did that because I got bullied as well, and that stayed with me for a while, mm-hmm. for long till I actually oh, yeah, could yeah. fill that hole. Um, so. Have you been able, though, to... Well, you tell me. I know you were going to say something. No, I was going to say that I'm... We are the sum of our experiences. Mm -hmm. And I've had... I've dealt with some horrible things in my lifetime. And, yeah, we all have baggage. You know, some of us are, are better equipped to deal with our baggage. I mean, I've been... You know, when I was a toddler, I was sexually molested. 
I was physically abused. Uh, I've been mm. bullied. You know, I've I've been through a lot. That but makes, yeah. I'm able to, fortunately, yeah, of course, I, I'm scarred in many ways, but for whatever reason, I'm not bogged down by it. And I don't know, I think maybe my fear of failure has been what's motivated me to be so successful. Mm-hmm. My, like, nothing trumps my fear of failure, you know? Why, what does failure mean to you? Um, <sighs> Is it that kid that was bullied that now you're, it's like. Yeah, I guess, yeah. you know, well, I don't even think so much about the kid that was bullied as much as, you know, knowing that I, I don't want to be in the places that I used to be. And in order not to be in those places, I have to achieve new levels of success to take me away from those places. And in that case, yeah, success isn't necessarily financial. You know, psychological and emotional and other ways to be able to say like, I did it, you know, not, you know, cashing the check that comes with doing it. But, you know, in my case, for example, um, you know, I, and there are steps like I got out of prison. Okay, fuck, I got to get a job. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to hire me in a regular job because I'm a convicted felon. Somebody says, hey, you ever tried bouncing? No, not really, but you know, I, I could look after myself. I know how to handle myself. And mm-hmm. I, I end up working on South Beach at a place called The Living Room, which at the time was the most exclusive club on the beach, where I met Kimbo Slice, as okay. a matter of fact, and we became friends. And my first success came when I rose up to become assistant head of security. It's like, wow, I'm making a little bit more money now. I'm given some responsibility, and you know, people are asking you know, people who are older than me yeah. are asking me questions and I'm giving orders and I'm like, okay, this is cool. Um, then, you know, starting pro wrestling and just getting booked to wrestle throughout Florida. People are, you know, okay, this is another level of success. And you take that to the point where I'm standing in the ring at WrestleMania <laughs> against, you know, at that time, my favorite wrestler for the storied United States Championship. This is a completely different kind of success. Yeah. You know, this is a goal, a vision that I had for myself. The check that came with that was phenomenal. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but just to look around and be like, you did it. Yeah. You are capable. Yeah. You can do it. You can be whatever you want to be. And for me, I found it took, a, and, and this is a problem going back to kids, confidence, belief in yourself. The, there's no one every day telling these kids, you, you don't have to be here. You don't have to do that. You can do better. There are other options. Belief in yourself, having that laser beam focus and saying, okay, I can do more than, oh, you'll never be anything. You know, mm-hmm. no, no, I will be something. I'll show you that I'm going to be something. And it's a great story. I used to work at a place I won't even give them credit. I worked at a furniture, very well-known furniture company in Florida in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. One of my independent wrestling buddies got me the job because I wanted to get away from South Beach and bouncing. I just, I needed to hit a reset button. I wanted to focus on wrestling and um, I'm a natural leader. Yes, you are. And I was unloading uh, trailers. So the guys that I was with, they were, you know, so I remember the crew, I had some Haitian guys and some Central American guys. Not particularly well educated, nice guys, very hard working. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, instead of doing this, let's, you know, organize guys. And all of a sudden, hey, man, this is easier. It's working better. We got a good thing. So people took notice of that and said, mm-hmm. hey, uh, this guy wants to talk to you. And he said, I've noticed, you know, you people are talking good about you. You're doing some pretty good things around here. If you want to move up in the company, come see me. All right, cool. So one afternoon, I saw him in the uh, cafeteria, and he had a couple of his managers with him. He ran the warehouse. Okay. And he sat down, and I said, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about moving up. Now, my thought process is, I just want to make more money. Mm-hmm. I don't plan on being here. This isn't my future. <laughs> and he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I thought, I don't want to work here, you know. But I said, well, uh, I'm a professional wrestler, and... Um, I guess uh, until Vince McMahon calls me, I can work here for you. 
so almost verbatim what I said. And he <laughs> looks at his, his guys and he goes, if Vince McMahon calls you to work for him, the Doors are going to call me to be their lead singer. Oh. And I was just saying, yeah, okay, well, we'll see what happens. Fast forward, my buddy Sean, who still worked there at the time, I came back to South Florida for something, and I signed an action figure. Dear so-and-so, have the Doors called you yet? Oh, wow. And gave it to Sean to give back to him. You know? <laughs> I love that. So... The best revenge is living well. Dude, that's my favorite. I saw, I saw this with Monte Cristo when I read about it. And it's funny because I never, I'd seen that on your arm, but never like stopped to really, read. that's my favorite book. Mine too, yeah. My favorite, favorite, favorite I of all time. Edmund the Dante's. Count, I'm, I mean, seriously, The Count of Monte Cristo, I, I read it, uh, I think it was in middle school or something, so long ago. And I read it while I was me. in prison. I bet that was so for me it was like amazing my friends betrayed me and you know now I was guilty Edmund Dante yeah, wasn't yeah, guilty yeah. I was guilty but yeah. the betrayal and you know the other yeah. things that took place you know there were lots the you know when he was in prison the old uh, uh, cleric that was yep. teaching him I had these old convicts teaching me there were so right. many similarities and when I got out don't think for a second that there weren't days that went by that I thought about how I was going to fuck these dudes up, that friends that betrayed me and people that snitched on me, you know, like all the time I thought about it, mm -hmm. how I would exact my revenge. And then it became less and less important as I focused on other things. And when I achieved the success of becoming MVP, well, I didn't need that revenge anymore because those people, their kids play with my action figures. Right. They watch me on TV. Right. And it was after a while that I realized like, I have become the Count of Monte Cristo. And the best revenge is, in fact, living well. Yeah. So that was redemption for me. Yeah. And, you know, I say, coming back to being a convicted felon, when I got to the WWE, I was given an opportunity that society wouldn't give me society wouldn't give me a chance to make minimum wage yeah vince mcmahon said yeah you did some bad things but everybody here gets an opportunity you've earned an opportunity and he gave me an opportunity to become an internationally known professional wrestling superstar mm -hmm. and with that came social redemption yeah because i'm still number one nine zero one nine seven you never forget that number wow I'll always be that. And in the eyes of certain people, even now today on social media, if I make a comment about, you know, social issues or something, yeah, well, you shouldn't have kidnapped those people, you know. Oh, my gosh. 30 years ago. Wow. You're right. I shouldn't have kidnapped those people. But I went to prison and I served my time. Right. And that's done. Right. Um, but at this stage, because I'm MVP, and because I used to be the, the, one of the spokesmen for the National Guard Youth Foundation, and because I go to Huntsville Prison and, and give speeches in juvenile, because I do that, now there is a segment of society that will say, like, he's a changed man. Mm -hmm. He's not what he used to be. Yes, he's MVP. And, and I even did a promo about, promo about it once saying, you know, there was a time in my life when I walked across the street, you would ease over and try to lock the door because you were afraid of me. You would clutch your purse a little bit tighter if you saw me in the parking lot. Mm. You wouldn't want me to date your daughter. You wouldn't want me to be at your house. But now, I'm, I've, I've done all of those things that you know about, yeah. but I'm on TV every week. Yeah. And I'm in commercials, and I'm done. Now, yeah, well, yeah, come please date my daughter. Oh yeah, come hang out and have drinks. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I love this guy. Well there's some sense of social redemption that was given to me because I was given this platform to show I'm a good guy. And with that, I yeah. took that and tried to make some changes in other people's lives who went through what I went through or potentially are going in that direction. So I was given a chance to be redeemed socially. Mm -hmm. But what about those that can't wrestle? What about those that can't sing? What about mm -hmm. those that can't run fast or jump high? Or, you know, how do they get their social redemption? They just want to work and pay taxes and have a life. And yeah, they made a bad decision. They did something bad and they went to prison and they served their time. But they're still serving. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, that's why I wanted to bring it up for sure on this because I think that that has got to change somehow, some way. That's got to change. I don't know what the answer is though, because you're saying it's so political. I don't know how you get that um, over and done with. No, so well, it's not going to be but... over and done. But and that's one of my biggest issues right now, just with society. The the, the politics is so tribal. It's not about right or wrong. It's about my team and your team. Right. You know, oh, let's own the libs. Oh, let's own the conservatives. You know, oh, Republicans are evil. Oh, Democrats are stupid. You know, like, it doesn't even matter about the issues. It's just my team, your team. You know? Right. And, and I mean, if we're going to be honest, the powers that be exploit that. Yeah. They don't want us to all come together and figure out what we have in common. Right. <clears throat> they, wanna, they want us to focus focus more on what keeps us divided yeah because then the powers that be continue to be the powers that be yeah yeah no i i 100 percent agree with you i what is happening right now i think is completely i've always said even my sister and i we have different views uh but i adore her Mm -hmm. and i respect her and i respect that she's got a view and she respects that i have a view we just happen to think different but it's okay. It doesn't mean she's right or wrong. It doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. We just have different views. And I think that that's what makes a beautiful country, what makes a beautiful world. If, imagine, I always tell people, imagine, um, you know, we have a world where we have pizza and hamburgers and hot dogs and we have so many things that we can eat and enjoy and Chinese food and this and that. Imagine that, nope, it has to be one thing, just pizza for the rest of your life for every single meal. You know, but I think it's ridiculous. I think it's our nature as 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 a species, as humans. I think we automatically we're, we're tribalistic. Mm-hmm. I'm another. I'm a northerner. Well, I'm a southerner. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm USC. Oh yeah, I'm UCLA. You know. <laughs> we're yeah. tribal by nature. Yeah. And I, I I think that that's something that people get into because you say okay, well we're gonna have all of this food and you can eat whatever you want to eat. Okay. Oh yeah. Well you eat meat. <sighs> You're a terrible person yeah. if you eat meat. Oh, you're one of those those vegan Nazis. Oh, I hate you people. Which is why I say that's wrong. Yeah. I don't get I have friends who are vegan. I'm not vegan. I will eat meat. I don't <laughs> care. Like, but you want to eat vegan? I don't care. That's why I say, even games, okay? I, I'm um, USC, and when I say USC, the uh, USC, which is the University of South Carolina, which was there ah! first before Silicon <laughs> Cal. Like, just, you, you, let me just, just say Gamecocks were there first, okay? And it's really funny because when the Gamecocks play the Trojans, mm-hmm. we always say, your Trojans can't handle our cocks. <laughs> Whoa! I've never heard that before. I like that. Ooh, isn't that okay. great? <laughs> <laughs> That's good but stuff. We also don't like Clemson. But it doesn't mean I hate Clemson. Sure, it doesn't mean that sure. I'm like, but we're just like, oh, you know, if my team is going to be playing Clemson, of course I want my team to win. But I don't go, oh, I hate you. I hate, which is what's happening now. Yes. And that's what I mean. Yes. And what is also happening that I am so against is what, you know, Breonna Taylor, uh, what's happened to um, Amon, uh, Arbery, you know, what's happened to George. I mean, these what they're going through. It's being caught on video, which thank goodness is being caught on video. Which, Amy, makes, which makes you has to, have to ask the question. Yeah. How many thousands, thousands, thousands are not being caught? They have never been caught. Right. It, we're, we're in South, Southern Cal right now. Yeah. When Rodney King was caught on film, videotape being beaten by police, yep. there were a bunch of people that went, oh my God! And you had people go, Psh, that's, you know, and, and various communities go, yeah, we see that all the time. Yeah. I watched, uh, I, was, I love Sanford and Son, you know. Oh, yeah. And I watched an old episode of Sanford and Son just a few months ago where the, con- the, the, the joke was about, uh, I think, Fred Sanford's diet and hypertension being the leader, the leading killer of, of, of black men. And Fred Sanford, Red Fox's character says, I thought it was the LAPD. Oh, you know? wow. So this is nothing new. Wow. This is something that's been going on for a long time, but now everybody has a camera phone. Right. And again, you, this is one of those super sensitive subjects. It's sensitive, but at the same time, it has to be talked about. Well, you have the issue where you talk about police. Yeah. And policing and policing policies. I come from a family of law enforcement. I'm yeah. the black sheep. 
And I've heard conversations that you go, oh my God, is the cops talking like this? You mm -hmm. know? And it happens all the time. And we have this, you know, this this mythologized idea of, you know, cops is their 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 word is infallible, and, yeah, you know, and they're all good. And all yeah, this, right. Yeah. If, if you know, if a cop takes a stand and gives testimony, automatically their testimony is giving more, gives given more gravity than yours because mm -hmm. they're a cop. Right. The badge, you know, the the honor and trust that we put in these people to protect and serve. Right. But we know that humans fail mm -hmm. and we know that there are people that are going to abuse the system yeah and we know that you know chris rock does a really good joke about police and the people who go well most cops are good chris rock says yeah you only say that about policing you don't say that about pilots well most of our <laughs> pilots land you know Wow, never heard of that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he does a joke yeah. about that. Yeah. And there's a, well, you know, there's, you just have a few bad apples. Well, the term is a few bad apples spoil the bunch. Yeah. So when people say, oh, yeah, but they're good cops. Okay, but well, when these bad cops are doing this, where are the good cops to step up and say, hey, don't do that? Mm -hmm. And there's a very realistic problem yeah. with, you know, and you know, De Detective Joe Crystal comes to mind. Um, you know, can look up some names. There are some cops that have stepped up and said, "Hey, this guy did this, and now they're a rat. You're right. betraying your brother." And you said how important it's not to be a rat. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the pressure that you went ahead and went to prison without ratting anybody out, they're feeling that in their mm -hmm. community. And for them, you got to think. Okay, I'm a cop and I see this cop doing something wrong. He's very well liked. I report him. Now, if I call for backup, what if somebody says, well, I'm gonna wait a few minutes. Right. Don't think it doesn't happen. Right. You know, I, like I said, I come from a family of law enforcement where I've, I've heard stories and I know things that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at Chicago PD. They had a black ops off-site. It's, it's all proven now. It, it, people talked about it for years. Lots of people in Chicago knew about it. But a place where the cops would take people, where you couldn't, they're not booked into the system. There's no paperwork, like where are they? And they would be tortured. <clears throat> and the chief knew about this. Mm. They were holding tasers to guys' genitals to, to get confessions out of them. And it went all the way to the top. Wow. And the problem is, okay, they found out about it. They got information about it. That chief didn't go to prison. He didn't even lose his pension. Mm. You know, and a lot of the time these cops will do something wrong. They'll resign, mm -hmm. they're not prosecuted, they show up on another department, and they're allowed to continue to do what they do. I think, <clears throat> yes, police have a very difficult job. And at times, certainly a dangerous job. No question and about And no it. question we need them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, it, it, it's a necessary evil. It yeah. is unnecessary, you know? yeah. And yeah, I would it, say, no blanket statement, not all of them are bad. Well, I just don't like to put a blanket statement well, on anything. I, I get that, I get it's that. It's like, I don't like to put a blanket statement. But saying, here's what I say, if you're a good yeah. cop, yeah. and you witness a cop do something illegal, mm -hmm. and you don't do your job, are you still a good cop? No, but you said it too, the pressure that they're feeling. Of course, of course. Of if I snitch on this, so what, am I a snitch? Am I so gonna, they're not gonna do be do? there for me? You know, and, Holy and people, moly. So now we have this conundrum. You've got cops within the system that wanna do the right thing. And you've got bad cops within the system that for the most part they do the right thing, but they yeah. also, well, we're gonna do this because we can. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna keep your mouth shut. <clears throat> I would love a system where you know, one of the issues really is the uh, the, the police unions. Yeah, the police. unions in general. Yeah. I just I think well, unions they, were there for the right reasons. I think when they were officially formed, but I feel like there's been a lot of corruption within unions as well. So with, with police, because I've I've had some people go, "Oh, you hate cops." No, because I'm asking for accountability mm -hmm. and transparency for all cops. Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't be that, you know, a cop has various complaints in their record, but you can't see them. You're not allowed to see them. That's a deal that the unions work out. You know, in certain cases where a police officer shoots somebody, they have X amount of days where you can't question them. You can't talk to them. They get an opportunity to talk to their police union rep and, and, and speak to their... 
So everybody has time to, you know, let's get our stories together. You, know, you don't get that. Right. I don't get that. Right. Nobody else gets that. Right. And generally speaking, I'm all for holding police up as, you know, the protectors of community. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to hold them up, we got to hold them to a higher standard. Absolutely. We can't say, well, he made a mistake. Yeah. Well, if a surgeon makes a mistake and somebody dies, they can't go, ah, sorry. No, they're sued like crazy. <laughs> right. You know? But the problem is if a cop gets sued for killing somebody and going, oh, yeah, I, I was in fear of my life and I, I, it, I, he came out of the shadows. I was scared. I shot him. Okay, that's a legitimate issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That can happen. And I, my heart would go out to both sides in that situation. Mm -hmm. But if there is uh, an issue with negligence, the taxpayers pay it. Not the police officer. Yeah. The city, county, state, whatever, they pay it. So if there was some other way to make them feel that financial burden, but then the response is, well, cops go, well, then why should I put myself out there like that if I don't have anything protecting me from these issues? So it's it's really complicated and intertwined, but if you don't have one half of the equation, in this case, law enforcement saying, yes, we have a problem. How do we work with community and work with society to fix this problem? Right. I think one of the issues is we don't have community policing anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> you got cops that live in Long Island working in, in the Bronx. They're not invested in that community. They don't know people in that community. Right. So the people who live in that community feel like this is an occupying force. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the cops who come in there feel like it's an us against them mentality. And it is. <clears throat> They're, you know, gone are the days when Officer Jones knew everybody. Mm -hmm. And, off, you know, if you were messing around, Officer Jones would grab you by your ear and take you home to your mom and go, hey, he's out in the streets. If I catch him out here again, it's going to, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of gone away. <clears throat> and, again, we're coming back to the issue of, you know, the, what's socially acceptable. So if you grow up in a community and say, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a cop because I want to make a change and I want to be better. You want to be a cop? Oh, man, you know, uh, fuck you going to come around here and, you know, man, I want to hang out with you. You want to be a cop. Mm. You know? And you want to be a cop. And you do want to make change. And you do want to do good. Mm -hmm. And you make it through the academy. And then you find out, hey, you got you to gotta go along to get along. Yeah. You know? you know Mustafa Ali was a cop? Who? Mustafa Ali. Oh, that Mustafa Ali. Uh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. I just like, oh, yeah, okay, Mustafa yeah. Ali. It took me a minute. Yeah, he, um, he was a cop. Talk to him about that because... He got in there because he really wanted to do good, and he talked about some of the things that he was facing. Uh, I think it would be really good for you to have a conversation with him and speak to him the way, you know, your dad was an officer, mm -hmm. but like what your take on it, because he was in there. He can t tell you from that side and what his view is and maybe how difficult it is to make change or not change or I don't know. I just think it would be really good for you to have a conversation. Yeah. I think the more conversations that we have... But that's what we Better. need. We need conversation. And yeah. we need empathy. Yes. And on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I know how I, I, I come from a family of cops and I was a criminal. Yeah. It's so wild. I know you, both, both sides. sides. I know. And yeah. I'm not I was no angel. I went to prison and I was supposed to be in prison. You know, that I should have been there. But I've seen police brutality unleashed. It was horrific. And unwarranted right and everybody cleans it up and nothing happens you know and part of the problem is okay yeah we have people that go well yeah he did this he deserved it anyway it's not the police it, it's not the police's job to tune the guy up no yeah you beat up this old lady your job is to apprehend remand to custody gather evidence let that person be prosecuted beating that dude in the head with the nightstick yeah yeah, it probably makes you feel better on, 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 on some level. And does he deserve it? Yeah, yeah, he deserves it. But that's not your job because now you've broken the law mm -hmm. that you've sworn to enforce. And when you're a cop, it's, it's, it's a tough, nerve-wracking job. Yeah. And it's not made easy. But when you break the law at that point, are you still a good cop? I always say if we could just 
at the end of the day, look in the mirror and be proud of our choices and be like, was I a good human being today? You know, did I show up in these ways or whatever? And just be accountable for your own actions. We would, you said at the very beginning, spread a little bit more love, trickle, yeah. you know, but when these protests, the other thing that bothers me, uh, not about the protests happening, I totally believe that people just want to get out there and, and really um, bring attention to it. But when then looting happens and, you know, that I think it's, it, it, it washes away the protest in a way. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit here for one second and tell you that, yeah, when, when the looting happens that, you know, that's a good thing. And in every situation, there's opportunism. Yeah. No matter what happens. Right now, the whole COVID pandemic. Yeah, there are people that are sadly making money yeah. on this pandemic. You know, people have asked me. Well, Gouging. And, yeah. yeah. yeah you know, so people have asked me, like, do, do you think that you know, the, the, the COVID pandemic is, you know, some kind of op special operation or, you know, different conspiracy theories. Do I think that a bunch of people came together and did a, a pandemic? No, we've had viral outbreaks, you know, throughout history. Do I think that there are nefarious people who will opportunistically capitalize on that? Of course, mm -hmm. of course, always we have that. Um, so in the same situation, people are standing up for what they believe is right and protesting. And then you have people who are opportunistic. Um, and I've explained this before, where if sometimes you snap. Yeah. And sometimes communities snap. And people go, well, why would you burn down your own neighborhood? There's no ownership in the neighborhood. Black people in that community don't own that Target or that gas station or that hair salon or, you know. Yeah. So they don't feel any sense of connection to it. That's not mine. No, we don't have anything here. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm trying to explain some of the mentality behind yeah. it. Um, fuck it. Burn it down. When people, um, I forgot who said it famously, but that uh, riot is, is, is the voice of the unheard. Mm -hmm. And no, it doesn't make it okay. And no, of course, looting is wrong. Of course. Um, and there's no way to validate or justify it, but it happens. But what I wonder about is, okay, you're more the people who are more focused and upset about people burning and looting than about what happened to even what create caused that, that to happen. Right. You know, so <clears throat> if, if you have, you know, a situation where police officers kill a suspect and people go, hey, we want some accountability. And you're more upset about the way people respond to that than about what happened. Then I think that says more about you as a person. Mm -hmm. And this is my humble opinion. Um, I don't ever think that rioting is the right thing to do. Um, but it's kind of, is it okay to grab a semi-automatic weapon and storm into a federal building and demand that, mm -mm. that you know, economies be open back up? There was no armed response to that, you know? I, I don't know. It, it, we live in a sick and twisted society. You know, it's almost the same thing as what happened to you. You were bullied so badly that one day you snapped. <laughs> That's what happens. Like people are feeling so discriminated against mm -hmm. and it's happening now and it's being caught and now they're seeing it and they're going, see, we're not just making it up. This is what's happening, well, right? To that point, it's snapping. You, sometimes you see videos and, and when we see it, everybody's so happy to see it. You see videos of a cop taking off his gear and playing basketball with some kids in the neighborhood. Or you'll see a cop come over and say, hey guys, there's been some complaints in the neighborhood about the music, you know, could you turn it down? I mean, music's great, you know, but can you turn it down just a little bit? Right. You'll see that, and you know, that's what it should be. Right. But then you, you know, the problem is when you get the ones who go, hey, turn that shit down! Right. That's not good for anybody. Right. That's not necessary. At that point, who are you protecting, who are you serving? Right. You know, diplomacy goes a long way. And this is where I come back to, you know, neighborhoods and, and neighborhood policing. 
when the police in the community know the people and mm -hmm. the people know the police, then you have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, the police that are in that community don't have the sense of it's us against them. And the police in that community feel, hey, those are our police. Mm -hmm. They're there for us. They're not an occupying force. You know, I don't have to worry about just because I look a certain way, this cop's gonna put me up against the wall and pat me down and you know, I just got home, I'm hanging out in the stoop, I just got home from school. But the cops in that neighborhood know, hey, that's Jimmy and that's Joe and that's Tyrone. And okay, there's David. David's trouble. Let's go <laughs> check on David. But Jimmy and Tyrone, yeah. they're good kids. I wonder why they did that. Separated, where the cops now are going to different areas. Um, I, but they just, it's uh, over time, you had, you know, departments recruiting. Okay, LAPD, famously, you know, as, as we're in South Florida. Famously, the LAPD, back in the 50s, recruited officers from southern states. Mm. So you had a whole bunch of officers from the southern states mm -hmm. moving to Los Angeles to become police, which uh, a lot of people don't know. The Black Panther Party came about because they were trying to take care of their own community, and the whole thing about wearing guns and wearing rifles became about protecting themselves from... At that time, racist cops who were just, you know, being, treating people poorly. And you had these community programs that came up where kids were being fed and kids, you know, there was uh, uh, community health programs. And this is essentially what we should all have, you know. And again, this is the epitome of what you saw where people who lived here said, okay, here's an outside occupying force come in and treating us poorly. Mm -hmm. And these people were coming in going, yeah, these animals, we got to protect ourselves. But going back to my original point, if you have a kid from that neighborhood who says, I want to grow up and be a cop and I want to make something different. The kids from that neighborhood go, oh, you want to be a cop? So there's this fractured relationship mm -hmm. that both sides desperately need to work on to improve so that we can get to a point where I don't feel afraid when a cop pulls me over or where a cop doesn't feel afraid because I'm a large black man. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're both on that precipice. Ooh. How do we move beyond that? Right. Well, I know conversations start things. I know that's the place to you start. Have to engage. You have to engage. You have to yes. engage. All right. You have to engage and there has to be empathy. <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay. Well, I want to ask, though, because you left WWE in 2010. First of all, why did you leave uh, WWE? Uh, because my dream was to wrestle in Japan. Oh. Yeah. When I started professional wrestling, I was introduced to Japanese wrestling. Norman Smiley. Yeah. He, uh, he introduced me to Japanese wrestling. He wrestled in Japan for some time. Excuse me. And I was like, whoa, that's intense. Mm. Wow. Um, so I had a dream, I wanted to wrestle in the Tokyo Dome. Oh, wow. I wanted to wrestle in New Japan pro wrestling. And I had a year left on my deal. And I asked Vince McMahon, actually I asked Johnny Ace at the time, because we used to talk, a lot of people don't know Johnny Ace made his career in Japan. Oh, for all Japan, right. 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 So there are many times when me and John would drink a beer and we'd talk about pro wrestling and I would you know, just, just sit there and, and drink up all of his stories about Japan and, and the guys that I used to watch on VHS tapes that he worked with. And, and I had a year left on my deal and they were trying to get me to resign a five year deal. Mm. And I just, I didn't want to at the time. I wasn't, uh, my, the, my inner flame was kind of flickering, you know? Yeah. And, Japan was calling me and I needed to I needed that that fire again. I I'm glad you listened. Motivation. You would have always wondered if you didn't do well, it. Well, I always said before I retired. I used to say all the time before yeah. I retire, I'm going to go to Japan so at least once in my career I can hear <laughs> And I did that, you know. And yeah. I will always say this, I Love Vince McMahon or hate Vince McMahon, no matter how you feel about him, he's always treated me well. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he gave me an opportunity when no one else would. Yeah. When I said I wanted to leave to go fulfill a dream, he didn't have to let me out of my contract. He could have said no. Right. He said, okay, come back 
door's open for you to come back, you know, come back a year, two years. You'll be a bigger star than when you left because, you know. Yeah, you, Japan, yeah. And, and, and Johnny Ace was like, hey, you're only going to get better, so you'll come back, you'll be better, and it'll be, oh, MVP's back, you know. Yeah. And uh, it took me 10 years to get back. I was going to say, but you didn't come back right away. Why didn't no. you? Um, I, I went and wrestled in Japan for a couple of years, and I loved it. Yeah. It was everything I dreamed it would be. Oh, that's great. Um, and then I just took a year off, and that's when I started training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And that became my new love, and I started mm. doing tournaments and competing. And then, um, and then um, when I was ready to come back to WWE, I got a call from TNA, and they offered me a really good deal. You know, I had less workload for a considerable right. amount of money, and I was like, "All right, yeah, let me try this for a little while." Yeah, and um, especially because the grind—it's a grind, and especially coming off of Japan. Yeah. Where I'd be there for a couple of weeks and I'm off for a few weeks. And I'd be there for right. a while and I'm off for a Your while. Balance. Yeah. Your balance. Yeah, Whereas being on the road 52 weeks a year with WWE, it's, it's a very demanding <sighs> schedule, as yeah. you know. Yeah. So I had an opportunity to uh, do something that I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it. And then uh, when things wrapped up over at uh, TNA, uh, I wasn't ready to come back to WWE yet at that time, and I, I was working on the indies, which I enjoyed. I was making my own schedule, working when I wanted to work, and it's, you know, going from that to going to okay, I'm gonna go back and work 52 weeks a year, three, four nights a week. Yeah, you know, it, it's a, it's a big jump, and um, as luck would have it, here we are, 10 years later. My son is five years old, and he's a massive wrestling fan. Oh. So the reason that I came back was because my son, I wanted my son to see me and as he calls it, WW Wrestling. Oh, so that's so cute. He used to always, wow. like he started liking wrestling before he knew brands or whatever, but he understood that he would be in my closet and he'd see my like Japanese ring coat and he'd, oh, this is Daddy Fight. He called it Daddy Fight. Daddy Fight. Daddy Fight. Oh, that's Daddy Fight. Yeah. And, uh. He uh, he just became this. Yeah, you know, I, I think his uncles are to blame on his mom's side. I think they were showing. Sure. But yeah. um, so I made a call. I asked W because they had asked me about coming back as a surprise at the Rumble before, and at the time it just wasn't something that I was interested in. And I reached out and I'm like, hey, you guys asked me before. If you're still interested, I'd love to come back now, uh, just for the Rumble surprise entry. And they were like, sure, we'd love to have you. Yeah, come on back. Uh and then see I tell people all the time seize opportunity pick up the phone yourself don't wait for them to come to you yeah and I reached out and everything yeah, love yeah, it love to have you back sure yeah you know and, then, and it was surprise your music hit it was <sighs> it was pretty cool and then the next night well the, the highlight for me that night was my son was in attendance his oh. first rest, his first WWE event was the Royal Rumble. Before the shutdown, too. That's going yeah, great. Yeah, so he got to see, you know, and it was at Minute Maid. It was this huge. And uh, then after after the show, I brought him to the back. His favorite wrestler is Rey Mysterio. Mm. He got a chance to meet Rey Mysterio. And Rey gave him a mask. Because you, know, you know Rey Rey. Of so course, he's awesome. so amazing. And um, then they asked me if the next night I would wrestle in San Antonio, which I was like, yeah, sure. It's an easy drive. And Paul Heyman... Um, he he and I were, have been cool for a very long time, and I had told him about Ray being my son's favorite wrestler. And the next thing I know, at first I was in some sort of a tag match, and a little while later, Paul Heyman comes back. It's you and Ray. Go have fun. Oh my gosh! And I was like, wow, because I knew my son, son was watching. Oh you know? man! And then after that, uh, John Laurinaitis called me over to the side and said, "Hey, let's have a talk." And they offered me a position as producer, and I had intended to retire this year anyway. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, I was like 46 now, you know. Does your body hurt? Yeah, of course it does. Of course, you know? yeah. Um, but I was, I was ready to, you know, start winding down, and they offered me a producer's position, and I accepted it, and, but they still had value in me as MVP. So, hey, yeah. MVP, would you do a VIP lounge segment? Hey, MVP, could you do this match real quick? Hey, MVP, could you... And the next thing I know, I'm doing TV stuff more than I'm doing producer stuff. And yeah. then the COVID hit, and the next thing I know, like everyone's, you know, getting let go, and you know, there's all all of these crazy things happening. And fortunately, I'm 
still on TV. And they asked me, hey, MVP, would you like to come back full time? And I'm looking at this little five-year-old who who is he can't stop talking about wrestling. Wow. Not only that, because the schedule's not that crazy anymore right now. Well, the schedule's great, you know, there's and, and I'm at a different point in my career and my yeah. life and and I still want to intend to retire, but what a great way to close out the chapter. Yeah. You know. So and, and you have balance and you're back on T V and you have steady paycheck with so many people have lost their so jobs. You know, I'm, I'm so fortunate on so yeah. many levels. But one of my things that I now that my son is five, I remember when he was younger, it was a special thing seeing my son using an MVP action figure to teeth on. You know, he's gnawing <laughs> on while he's teething. You know? Yeah. And then when he got a little older, he really liked the Avengers. And Daddy would fight with the Hulk and Daddy would fight with everybody. Daddy used right. to get just beat up all the time. <laughs> And then I brought him to the first wrestling show for Booker T that he saw me wrestle. Um, his, he has a teenage sister from his mom who she, she kept an eye on him. And after he saw Daddy fight, now all of a sudden Daddy can beat Spider-Man and oh. Iron Man. I can, couldn't beat the Hulk. Never beat the Hulk. <laughs> but I can beat that. I can beat Thor. You know, so that, that's that awesome. <laughs> but you get through that, and I remember walking through the aisle of Target, Walmart, whatever, and thinking. <sighs> Man, I would really love for him to walk down the aisle with his cousins and be like, look, that's my daddy, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, now as talent, you know, I'm sure I'll have an updated action figure. And, you know, and now that's one more thing I can check off that list. And my son can go and see daddy on TV and pick up his action figure. And, and to come full circle, yeah. that's why Shad's death hit me so hard. Because I never wanted kids. Really? I never. I, I wanted to die a single, jet-setting international playboy. That was my thing. Oh I didn't wow! Want kids. Never wanted kids. And my my son was, oops. Okay. Oh, but it's my responsibility, you know. So that, that's my son. And I wasn't, you know, when I first got my son, I wasn't. Oh, you know, was right. the, the heavens didn't open up and angels <laughs> sang. Like I wasn't. It took a little while for me to understand. Or I guess for that love to... You also didn't have an example. You didn't have that com that bond with your father. Mm -hmm. Right. So of course you didn't understand it. But when it kicked in, yeah. and I fell in love with my son. When did it kick in? Do you remember? Um, it was weird because like, you know, for the first six months, I would drive to his mother's house because she lives way on the other side of Houston. And I would spend a few hours just, you know, to see him because... And then I think after six months, I was able to start taking him home. So he was a baby. And I'm like, yeah. dude, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bachelor playboy, man. I don't want a car seat in my Mercedes. And, <laughs> and you know, like, I, I got the ultimate bachelor pad, man. I right. put gates up so he doesn't tumble down the stairs. And, you know, but um, I just remember he was asleep. He was about seven or eight months old, and he was asleep. And whenever he'd wake up, if I wasn't around, he would cry. And I remember him waking up, and I was sitting on the other side. And he sat up, and he looked around, and I could see his eyes start to... And then he saw me, and he just like... And then he smiled at me and put his head down. Every, and, and that was the moment. It was just like, oh, wow. Wow. He saw me, and everything was okay. Hey, nothing to panic. There's that big guy. I'm okay, you know. And um, it... You know, it just changed everything for me. And Shad, I used to tell him, like, I was angry that I was going to have a baby. Angry. Because the circumstances were a little different than mm -hmm. what we agreed to, you know. And Shad was like, man, I'm telling you, it's going to be a beautiful thing, man. My, my son's awesome, man. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. You're going to love it, you know. And there were a few of my friends that were like, dude, I'm telling you, it gets better. I promise you. And I'm like, and then, as I started to post pictures with my son, and I'm you know, having these experiences, Shad, you see, I told you, man, I told you. Because Shad's son is 10. So his son was where my son is now, when my son was being born. Mm -hmm. So he had all these awesome experiences to tell me, look, man, when he does this, or when you guys do this, I'm like, yeah. 
when all these things were happening. Mm. And Shad would be, see, I told you so. Or Shad would tell me, man, I'm so proud of the father you've become, man, you know. And to think about his final act, telling lifeguards, hey, go get my son. Yeah. And then losing his life. And I've had friends die since I was a kid. I told you my best friend was shot and killed gang shit. And, you know, friends in prison, in the wrestling business, you know. Shad didn't die of an overdose. Right. Shad didn't have a heart attack. You Shad know. didn't take his own life. Yeah, Shad didn't commit suicide. You know, the, 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 the tragic circumstances around his death and his, his act of selflessness. And as a father, I understand that because I would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. Go get my son. And then as I'm looking at his beautiful son, his son's name is Araya. Yeah. Beautiful boy. God, he's a gorgeous kid. That hair. Yeah. Whoa. You know, what a gorgeous kid. <laughs> I just kept thinking about my son. Yeah. And I got choked up a little bit when I was at home. And my son asked, Daddy, why are you sad? And I explained to him what happened. I explained to him about daddy's friend and daddy's friend's son and, you know, the, the beach, because my son loves the beach and he loves the ocean. Mm. And I explained to him what happened and, you know, I, I was honest with him very. Yeah. And he said, well, daddy, I'm sad too now. So why are you sad? He said, because your friend's son doesn't have a daddy anymore. Mm. And the tears came. And, you know, the whole time I'm looking at this little boy, this beautiful little boy, I'm thinking about my son. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the bond that Shad and his son had and how Shad would light up. Like, he was so proud of that little boy. You yeah. Know? And that little boy, his last memory of his father is of his father giving his life to make sure that he was able to keep his, you mm -hmm. know. And at Shad's service, I like... I'm usually not one for emotion and tears. As I said, like, life is a part of death. Death mm -hmm. is a part of life, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's intertwined, it's, it happens, it's a thing, you know, mm -hmm. we, you know, we all have to deal with it, we deal with it differently. I didn't expect to tear up as often as I did, there were multiple times that I, you know, I never, I didn't break down in hysterics, but I cried. Yeah. Multiple times. Yeah. And that's not something I've done in a long time, you know, and then a lot of my other friends that I was close to, didn't, their death didn't affect me the same way. Everyone has said that. For some reason, this one has really, really hit them in the gut. It's a lot different. It is a lot different. But like I said, I, I'm hoping that this one stirs something so big in every single person, whether you knew him or knew of him. Whether you even heard, I know that there's some people that did not know him in the WWE, did not know him personally, heard the story mm -hmm. on TV and have been impacted just by the story. Well, the story that Kofi told. Yeah. At the memorial, two guys walking behind him. That hey, who was that right. guy? Oh yeah, him and his son got you know washed out by a, a riptide, and he you know drowned, telling the lifeguards to save his son. And the other guy was like, "Whoa, Whoa. wow, that's you know." Yep. But it makes you look at your life. Well, I told you, it's made me re-examine the kind of person that I am, right? And how I treat people, and how people receive me. Mm -hmm. Because Shad was just that huge heart. They're like, everybody's his boy. Where I'm like, I don't know that motherfucker. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know but I also man. know now, knowing your story, being molested, the gangs, all of this, trust, I'm sure it was definitely, and, and your mm. father not being there too, trust has not always been there. Sure. And, and, and instilled early on. So I also now can understand why you are a little bit more guarded. You know, why we need to get to know you before you will open up your arms. So we talk about empathy. There's empathy there that I can understand that. And I think the more that we understand what our backgrounds are and, and why we might be like this, instead of judging people so quickly, we can be nicer to each other. And I can give you more time to accept me as mm -hmm. someone in your life. But, you know, ultimately to that point, Shad left uh, an impression on me to reevaluate how I am. Mm -hmm. So I will be a better person yeah. after his passing. And I will be a better father yeah. after his passing. 
so yeah, we lost Shad, but hopefully, as you said, there's a ripple effect of improvements that we all make because of who yeah. he was. He left a gift. Yeah. He left many gifts, mm -hmm. which is really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you came on here and that you talked about your story and you've talked about so many things that, again, people are scared to talk about. They get so heated. And there might be even people that got heated even listening to some of this. But all I can encourage is, is listen with an open ear, without judgment, and you will hear things that with judgment, with a closed ear, you, you just can't hear it. But when you are allowing yourself to, um, to hear a different perspective, maybe it can leave where it's like, oh, I never looked at things that way. If we can live more like that, well, that's what we all need to do. Yeah. You know, let's, let's right. hear what the others, let's hear perspective. Well, like you said, empathy, yeah. you know, empathy, perspective, you know, yeah. just trying to see it from someone else's perspective. And, and it's not always easy to do, but it's, isn't that what makes us better mm -hmm. as people to be able to do that? Or at least to make the attempt. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, it's going to be fun to continue seeing what you do. You and Lana have got <laughs> some major heat with each other. I love it. Yeah. I think it's great. No, you're just such a great actor, too. Um, Thank you. You're not just Thank a great you. wrestler, but you can sell something so easy. You're so great on the mic, so natural. That's why it works. It works for you to be a wrestler, to have the M uh, VIP lounge, and to also be a producer. I think it's amazing. I think that WWE is very lucky to have you back. And cool. um, what's going to continue to you know flourish from this? And um, I always love to ask: Has your chase now? You're a little kid, okay? Looking at your life, has your chase for glory looked the way you thought it was going to look? No, <laughs> no, I never thought I'd be who and what I am today, and and the path that I took to get here. I, you know, and people ask me, as you said, you know, if if you could change everything. Would you? Well, then I wouldn't be who I am today. Yeah. We are the sum of our experiences. And while I am flawed, I have so many flaws, and I have issues, and I have baggage. We all do. For the most part, I'm okay with who I am. And I recognize those flaws. And, and I'm okay to discuss my flaws. You know, bring it to my attention. Let's talk about it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, my journey has led me here and if you changed facets of my journey then perhaps i wouldn't be here yeah perhaps i wouldn't be the man that i am today and you know there are other people who have been inspired i mean you know it's fortunate that you know, i have people send me dms and messages on instagram or when i meet people who will tell me you know how much i inspired them and when they found out about my story you know how it made them realize that they could be better and and where they could you know not erase past mistakes, but certainly not be bogged down by them, you know? Right. So when I hear that, you know, it, it validates a lot for me. And at the end of the day, no, I, I guess, I mean, if I could undo some of the hurt that I've done, I certainly would, you know, mm. I wouldn't, don't want to That's be the That's a beautiful way of, to put it. Yeah, if I wouldn't want, I hate being the source of, of, of pain for people, but in terms of, of what I had to go through as a result of those acts, no, I wouldn't change it. You know, I've apologized to the universe for my, my previous behavior, but I own it. You know, I never... That's brilliant, too. I own it. You I, show you know, strength with that. There's a lot of people that are constantly like, yeah, but, I did this, but, I, you I know. I can't. I, there's no but. I was an asshole, you know, and I recognize. And yeah, you could talk about the outlying circumstances and whatnot, but at the end of the day, I chose to do things. Those actions had consequences. Uh, I had to deal with those consequences mm -hmm. and then I was faced with a choice. What will you do from here on mm -hmm. out? Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I've done pretty well. You have. So. You have. And you are really a special person. I mean, oh, the shucks. Montel, seriously, that I've gotten to know, <laughs> I, I love you dearly. Like, oh my. Um, I have my moments. Yeah, you've been great. You've been great with me. I know that. <laughs> so tell people how they find you on social media. Uh, I am on... I I only do Twitter and Instagram. Okay. I think I think I have a Facebook fan page, but I don't do Facebook. Uh, I think WWE automatically runs one. Is what it do is. Do they? Do they have yeah, one? I yeah, think so. I think so. I think so. But how do they find you? Then? I'm on Twitter and Instagram at the three hundred five MVP. That's where you can find me. Um, I would also like to take a moment to plug 
ProWrestlingTees.com yes. and CollarAndElbowBrand.com as they are uh, probably the two biggest wrestling shirt companies. Yeah. Uh, there is, they both have a version of a shirt for Shad Gaspard. Yes. Um, and the proceeds for the sale of that shirt go to his wife and son. And um, Collar and Elbow, uh, Rod and Al Snow, I know them well. They're trustworthy. Yeah. You know, because when this happened, you know, as you know about the GoFundMe that was yeah. set up for the family, there were several GoFundMe set up by people who didn't have a right to do so. Right. You know? That's why we did the official. Right. And Took the others down, yeah, yeah. So Pro Wrestling Tees also agreed to do a shirt where the proceeds would go to the family. So there are two companies that you know we know we're familiar with, yeah. And they were cool enough to do that. So if you get a chance, please go to ProWrestlingTees.com, yes. collar and elbow brand, buy a T-shirt, uh, do a little contribution to the Gaspard family. Yeah, and um, they're gonna need it. They're gonna need it. It yeah. takes a lot to raise a ten-year-old, and. Yeah. Uh, with all of this, and she's now a single mom with, single with mom. A help, but but single yeah, mom. I but, mean, and there's a lot of love there, a lot of support. But at the end of the day, I mean, and here's the big thing: everyone's got their own finances to have to worry about, especially during COVID. But here's the thing: you know, you got to think, and this happens to everyone. Someone passes. There's a funeral. There's all the people around the support. So the person that has to deal with the passing, you know, the 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 husband, the wife, or whatever the case may be, they're inundated with stuff that has to be done: the funeral, right. this and that. And then after that, when everybody goes home, oh yeah, and then they're left to the reality of the empty bed or, or the, right. whatever the case may be, that's when things get really tough. Oh yeah. So the South, the Southern California family that's here, really has to make sure that Siliana Gaspard and Araya Gaspard are loved and they got a support system. Mm -hmm. They're not alone. Right. They're not you alone. Know? Yeah. Like I say Araya has a lot of uncles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've even told her, I'm like, come on, let's, uh, let's go to lunch. Mm -hmm. I really want to get to know her more. She's really cool. I also want to let you guys know that the GoFundMe is still active. And so it's very simple. You can just go to GoFundMe.com and just Google uh, or type in the Gaspard family and you'll see the official one. Uh, it just been amazing. The fact that uh, like seeing everybody contributing even five dollars ten dollars has added up and is helping people have been like wow it just made me feel like i helped and you you are you did you, did. you are so and, uh, you know Araya wants to go to college yes and, you know, so college is expensive. extremely expensive yeah. and like you said raising a 10 year old is expensive it's, it's, uh, yeah. so this is huge to to help with those expenses and to make sure that Araya has a bright future so yeah. if you contributed to the gofundme if you bought a t-shirt, if you thank intend you. to, on the, behalf of yeah. the Gaspar family and friends, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. You're, You're awesome. awesome, dude. <laughs> Thanks. My pleasure. This is Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video or a live stream. And definitely share this with a friend. All right, follow the show at Chase and Glory on Instagram, at Lillian Garcia on Instagram and Twitter, and Lillian Garcia official fan page on Facebook. For everything Chase and Glory, just go to chaseandglory.com. Until next week, go out there and live with much peace, love, and passion. And remember, always be yourself and trust that it's enough. See you guys. Bye. Thanks for joining us here on Chasing Glory from executive producer Lillian Garcia.